All right, now 52 participants now, and I think we can start. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to ASIC seminar series. Um, I'm John, the seminar coordinator, and Ms. Cassie Medvi is also with me. She's our communication specialist. And Cassie and I will be the moderator. And today we have um, Dr. Bill now with us, joining us from ASIC. Uh, let me introduce a few things before we start up. The seminar is being recorded and it will be later published in our YouTube channel. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, and Cassie will read them out loudly, or you can raise uh, your virtual hand and Cassie will unmute you and you can ask a vocal question. You are welcome to bring up any questions. Let me first um, give a brief introduction about the speaker before he starts. So Dr. Bill now is a senior scientist at ASIC and a joint professor of the Department of Atmospheric and Ocean Science at the University of Maryland. He received his BS from University of Hong Kong and PhD from University of Washington. He was an assistant professor in the Naval Postgraduate School um, before joining the NASA Goddard in 1981. He served as the head of the Climate and Radiation Branch and then chief of the laboratory for atmosphere and then the deputy director for Earth Science Division and NASA Goddard. His research spans over four decades covering a wide range of topics in climate dynamics, tropical and monsoon meteorology, ocean atmosphere interaction, aerosol water cycle interaction, and climate variability and change. He has received many awards and honors for his research and scientific achievement and leadership, including the Oxford Distinguished Lecture Award, uh, the Asia Ocean uh, Geophysical Society honorary professor um, at Peking University, the primary lecturer at John Hopkins, an honorary professor from the School of Energy and School and City University of Hong Kong, the Distinguished Alumni Award um, from Hong Kong University, the William Nodeberg Award in Earth Science, the Goddard Exceptional Achievement Medal and NASA John Lindsay uh, Award, the AMS Minsinger Award. He's a Goddard Senior Fellow, a Fellow of the AMS and a Fellow of the AGU. He served as the President of the Chinese American Ocean Atmosphere Association from 91 to 92 and the President of the Atmosphere Section of AGU from uh, 2015 to 16. Let's welcome the speaker. And Bill, I will give the ball to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, you notice that in introduction when uh, John said that I have done research in monsoon climate dynamic, you notice that the word wildfire was not there. So I'm not an expert on wildfire. So why am I talking about wildfire? And in fact, when John asked me a couple of months ago to give that seminar, I thought about it and said, okay, let's talk about it. In fact, I've done some research on wildfires and then somebody, and then it turns out the timing is almost perfect in the sense that now we are something raging wildfire in the, in the um, Western US. And we happen to have been working on this issue relating wildfire to climate change in the past two, three years. In fact, uh, this is actually the uh, topic of the uh, uh, PhD dissertation of one of my students, uh, Lei Zhang, uh, who is one of the co-author of this paper, and he's finishing up his PhD working on wildfire and climate action. And so, uh, so I acknowledge uh, other co-authors like uh, Wei Chen Tao and Professor Zhang Jing Li, and also uh, Kim Young Kim at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Okay, so so we're talking about wildfires. So let me just give you a little bit 
of the outline. As I said, this is almost like two talks, but related. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the wildfire situation in the Western US currently happening, all right? And then uh, I'm going to switch to look at the observed and model projected change in the large scale circulation, heavy circulation under climate uh, global warming. Okay, so this would be some past work that I did and many others have done. And then I'm going to talk about the, the, the main topic, which is the detection and observed trends of regional climate feedback exacerbating wildfire. I, I call it RCFW over the Western US linking those changes, okay, of the heli circulation. And by the way, this change in heli circulation, which is global in nature, is one of the few very robust signal coming out from almost all of the uh, climate model, of the state of the art climate model, uh, the CIMI-5, CIMI-6 model. Even details different, all those models show a very consistent change in the change in heavy circulation as a result of global warming. So I will get into that a little bit uh, later. So, so, so let me just uh, 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 revise um, the, the current situation. Um, I, I actually checked the current situation uh, right now, today, and as of yesterday, now the fire is still ongoing, but it is on an average about 50% contained now. So according to the newspaper article that I, that I read, but it's still containing. Fire warning is still very high in this region. And also um, uh, in terms of the, if you actually, there's a very detailed report of all those fires that are going on uh, uh, currently. They ranges from 90% uh, contained to 10, 15% con 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 contained. Okay, so it is still going on. The fire warning is still on, although it obviously have dropped from the peak of the last week, okay? So this fire in 2020 break all kinds of records, okay? In terms of burn area, uh, uh, which is uh, over 3 million acres in California, and then everybody kind of read the newspaper and knows that Oregon, Washington, and, and even some place in Colorado are also burning. So this is much larger scale than just California. Well, California happened to have kind of, uh, is, is a kind of wildfire state that has all those records. So it break the record in terms of frequency. In fact, I just read about this. In 2020, uh, if you add all the small and large fire, that's over 2,000 fire. This is the this is the most frequent and most severe. Three of the four of the largest California fire actually occur just the last uh, couple of weeks. Okay, three of the four largest fire. So and then there are. A lot of people talk about uh, a dry lightning, and uh, which is, uh, and then we can see from the satellite pictures, uh, all those clouds and so-called pyrocumulus clouds. The the wildfire generates its own weather uh, in terms of the convection and things like that. So so all those things are are, are um, unprecedented. Okay, strong winds. Okay, and then there was this extreme heat wave over the entire western U.S. And, and of course, this is this is also unprecedented. The worst toxic air quality over Western U.S. Not just Western U.S. And in fact, you will see pictures. Uh, I'm going to show you next that the entire U.S., including uh, the wind blows uh, both east and west, and over in Hawaii and over in the uh, in the uh, East Coast, uh, have been detected. And uh, in terms of property burn and people, all this are unprecedented. Here's this later chart. I basically got this from all this news report. So if you look at the uh, total acre burned by fire in California, starting from 1980 to 2020, you can see this is 2020. This is stick out like a sore thumb. And it's like three, four times more than this. You can see this trend here, this trend going on. And as you can see, four, if, if, if you count the four major wildfire burn area, you can see that this one is clearly way exceed the rest. So this is uh, this is what happened in the last couple of weeks over uh, uh, California and and also Oregon and, and Washington. So so what, what the the what you see basically this is happening over here, but you can see the effect in terms of air pollution of the it's just everywhere. So so you have you have winds blowing 
and then affecting the uh, western west coast area on the oceanic region. And then you have, so I, I'm blocking this away from you. Let me just move this out of the way. So, so, so you can see that that this this cloudiness pattern associated with the uh, wildfire here. Actually, many of the dust and and smoke and the uh, 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 particulate matter PM two point five PM ten can be detected all the way on on the east coast. And here is a measure of the aerosols from the west coast fire blown. Uh, east by the weather systems. You can see it's covered this entire US region, including the East Coast. And this aerosol index, uh, it is just un unprecedented. I mean, we, 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 this index, probably normal range, you, you consider really, really bad pollution, maybe of the range of right here, five to seven, you go to 14 right here in this region. So there's a lot of pollutant in the atmosphere and uh, and then you have the the, uh, the the aerosols being being transported eastward and affecting the east coast. Now, in terms of this, is actually the latest that I can get from uh, from from the information that there is something that uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oops, uh, let me go back to this one. Let me go back. I uh, if I can go back. Let me go back. Let me see. Oh, okay. So this is actually a measure of the, um, the, the uh, uh, at this time as, as uh, uh, most of the people working in this wildfire area are ecosystem type and forestry people. So they're really interested in this quantity called the vapor pressure deficit, which is kind of the, the one directly related to the atmospheric condition. And uh, so, so I will be keep referring to this VPD, the vapor pressure uh, deficit, because that's the term they use all the time. But it turns out it is um, directly related, almost like identical to relative humidity, which I will talk about a lot. So in the last 30 days, and they actually have, based on the weather charts and all the observation, they calculated this uh, uh, dry index, basically. This is the vapor pressure deficit. And uh, here, this in 2020, the west, Western US is really, really dry, okay? In the sense of that er, every measure is exceeding the 90 percentile in terms of, of the dry over a very large area, over a very large area, okay? So this is actually from in-situ observation and plus satellite and things like that that give you this one. So this, this is the entire Western US is very dry. So the question is why why is it so dry in this region? Of course, everybody is global warming. Okay, so let me uh, so let me just list the uh, so the National uh, uh, Climate Assessment, which is a U.S. Uh, document, in, a national document, which is gather all the information that that at that they, they publish it at that time from from the world from the published record, and they come up with this this statement is that. Global warming is most likely the root cause of increasing frequency of hydro over the Western US, okay? So during this period. And then there are many other drivers of, of course, of obviously dry vegetation and soil, increased flammability, fire, fuel accumulation. And this, this, this quantity is directly related to the meteorology is called increased pressure deficit, VPD, which if you just simply look at it, this is just simply uh, the vapor pressure, the saturated, Air, which is a temperature dependent with respect to the relative humidity, which I would focus on is both temperature and circulation dependent. That's a very important point, okay? And then we talk about increased lightning, fire induced pyrocumulus, excessively. So this one has been talked a lot about an internal feedback within the fire itself, which I'm not gonna talk about because there's a lot of uh, people talk about that. And then there are other factors like bark beetle infestation, forest management, which are all factors that could actually lead to that. But, but I'm going to focus on the root cause, okay? In fact, regional climate feedback, okay? So yeah, the Western US is getting really hot and dry, but why is it very unique in the Western US? Is it globally happen? Uh, so that's the question we want to address today. And in fact, uh, so again, quoting some of the ecosystem type, they, they, they did this work. And uh, so you could they, 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 they look at uh, some uh, degrees in temperature warming over California. So you can see that's a trend from 80, clearly a trend. And then you look at the standard deviation of uh, the chain deviation, the, 
the deviation of the some fire weather index, which combines humidity, wind, and things like that, you can clearly for the for starting from the 80, there is a positive trend going up. And uh, so I was able to actually get hold of this recently published article again by an eco, uh, by ecology people, and then they would be looking at CMIP five. Uh, I think this may be even CMIP six results and trying to look at uh, the conditions of the projection in the future uh, in terms of the 21st century uh, when the when the uh, global temperature increased to to 1.5 to 3 degree. This is 3.5 degree. This is uh, a scenario calculation. If you look at the the, uh, the this this, I think this is the VPT. Yeah, there's something like the fire weather index, which is rich, which is really one of those quantity VPT. You can see that this will be like the, the 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 50 to the 70, and then when the global warming is come to come up to the 20th century, late 20th century, you can see clearly there is very strong increase in that. Okay, but. As ecologists, of course, they only worry about places where they actually burn. Okay, they look at dryness over this region. They look at precipitation change, but they never look at precipitation over the ocean. Because to ecosystem people, I don't care about uh, precipitation over the ocean because I'm going to worry about uh, what is happening there for good reason because that they want to focus. But uh, when I actually become interested in this problem, I actually have a different question in mind. So this is when I first get interested in this problem. I actually wrote a proposal to NASA, actually get funded to do this work, which is really trying to make the linkage between uh, wildfire, actually the attention at the time was global wildfire increase and the changing uh, 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 global warming. One of the issue that really was puzzling to me was that, well, there is no doubt we are living now in a warmer and wetter world under the effect of greenhouse warming. Because if you have the warmer air, you have the larger capacity to hold the water vapor in the atmosphere. So you should get a wetter climate. Okay, so why are we getting, it is perplexing to me that we are seeing even more severe wildfire, a drier climate seems to dominate what we see. Okay, in fact, this is, I wrote this, this science here, for those who don't know, this is like the, which is a UK magazine, the, the scientific American equivalent in the UK. So, so actually I was contacted by the editor over there uh, because somehow they, they, they learn about my interest in, in looking at this problem. And so this is the, the rendition of, the, of their, the, the front page of this paper. In fact, you, you can get a copy of this article right here. Okay, so science here article, it's scientific American popular writing. I basically put down my hypothesis there in that because that was at the time we were doing the research. So, so the title is more water, more fire. The surprising link between between increasing global humidity, which I will show you because the, the, the world is getting warmer by definition, you're getting more water vapor, but we are also actually getting more fire. What's what? Why? OK, so this is. I, I, at that time, in that article, I just picked a uh, wildfire map in the world, and this happened to be, um, it turns out, it's, 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 it's the, the, the DJF, the December, which is a lot of the fire, which is a summer season in the Southern Hemisphere. You can see Brazil, you can see Southern Africa, you can see uh, uh, Northern Australia, just all this fire burning. And you can see a little bit here, as I said, this is actually to be the fire season in the Southern Hemisphere. But you also see that. So one thing you notice that all these fire are situated are situated in subtropical latitudes. Okay, yeah, some of them are in the in the equatorial region as well. So why do we get drier, increase uh, our climate and increase wildfire in a warming and wetter world? So that's my my issue. Okay, so in fact that's uh, that's also based on previous work. Uh, not our own. People have done that. People look at, uh, so this is, would be a trend of 1979 through to 2013. Uh, it, it, it's a short-term trend, less than 30 years. It's very difficult to, to, to say this is global warming, okay? But, but then you look at that, if you look at the minimum uh, uh, temperature, and, and then uh, you can see this trend, there's a positive trend in the Western US and in other regions as well, in Brazil, 
in all those fire regions in uh, Africa, in Australia, and, and, and in these days, you probably heard about each of these places have their own share of uh, wild, wildfire years, okay? Last year, we have Australia, right? Everybody will still remember uh, during the, 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 the uh, December, January, February, last year, we have, we have Australia, and, and many years, we have, we have Brazil. This year, we have, we have West U.S. stick out like a sore thumb, and we, we, we heard about, we actually know Western U.S. have that. So, why are these regions especially getting drier? This is getting warmer, this, this region. And then also getting drier. This is the minimum relative humidity. Okay, and you can see the Western U.S. This is now an 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 annual mean. So the Western U.S. still stick out like a sore thumb. So there's something special about this region. There are other measures which is less definitive as this one, showing that this region clearly is getting uh, warmer and drier. Okay, and and the entire Western U.S. So again, it's only for a short period, like 30 years, a linear trend. So I'm going to talk about why, uh, trying to understand why. So here is what I start with, meteorology. That's my training, start out from. So if you look at the climatological map of these subtropical high, the mean sea level pressure, climatological mean, you learn this from meteorology 101, that there are these subtropical high region in June, July, August, very strong subtropical high here, and DJF, that's sub that, that, that subtropical high, these are sometimes called stationary waves in, in meteorology terminology. And then in December, January, they move inland as well. So this actually, the, so I'm gonna focus, the Western US is happened to be like this, this region. Look at that, subtropical high, right at the edge, Western US, right at the edge of subtropical high uh, uh, in this region. And also, uh, and, and then this is the same, same position. So you can see in the winter time, it shifts inland. Okay, and then, in fact, over you uh, over the Atlantic, there's similar subtropical high, and in fact, this subtropical high extends to this region, and and you heard of wildfire in southern France, in Greeks, and all this region as well. So that is something interesting in between the western part of the continent, which is which is uh, Europe here, and then Western U.S. and then. Uh, and then, of course, when, when it's DJF, that's the winter monsoon here. So I'm going to talk about all this from a global uh, perspective in terms of how things changes. Okay. So so now, as I said, most ecosystem science they are interested in wildfire here. Okay. They don't care about what happened, the, the precipitation over the ocean, but I think that's important that we have to recognize that. I'm going to try to make that connection. So this is a familiar picture. Anybody in meteorology knows that this is the Atlantic ITZ, uh, the Pacific ITZZ region. These are the deep convection, heavy precipitation in that region, and that's the region of subtropical high right here, right in that region. Okay, these are region characterized by low clouds, infrequent heavy rain. Infrequent, sometimes they do get heavy rain, but infrequent, but mostly dry area, and then. At the northern edge of subtropical high, these are the mid latitude storm track regions, okay, that give us the daily weather fluctuation in that region. This is a, just a daily map. And in fact, you look at climatological, I mean, climatological here is a clearly precipitation pattern, drying pattern, and then wetting pattern. And look at the, U, the, the Western US right in that edge of that subtropical high region, okay? So, in fact, the rest of the time, I'm going to focus on how, what is the connection of the IDCC change and the area of expansion of this subtropical high, the drying region. It turns out that's very important part of it, uh, of what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so let me go to review some literature. This is work done uh, uh, by uh, many people. Uh, uh, this particular figure is taken out from, I believe, Seidel 2008, okay? There is now, based on CME5 model projections of global warming, there's now a consensus. In fact, all models look at, do pretty much the similar thing, except a difference in magnitude, okay? Which is basically, they talk about an expansion of the tropics. The tropic has widened, and then the Hadley circulation actually has uh, changed as well in terms of an expansion of the dry, dry 
of the dry zones, the subtropical high area, and also a movement of the mid latitude west, west, westerly forward. Okay, so so this is actually model prediction. In fact, if you look at all the CMIP models, they they actually produce very similar results, although they, they would differ in magnitude in terms of you do it 1% CO2 increase since industrial age, you run the model uh, to double CO2, quadruple CO2, that is a very consistent signal. And in fact, observation, again, very limited uh, observation of all, they, they come up with different parameters like jet stream position, the width of the of the uh, of, of this region defining some indexes that measures the, the kind of edge of the of, of, of the rising motion and then many different indices which they simply plot here as you can see you can say oh all of this seems to be increasing some stronger than the other so so of course these are what i call balance of evidence if you look at this you simply cannot argue simply that oh this if this, if this is the case but if you have all Simified model basically showing a consistent result and with good dynamical explanation, then you may say, hey, we are actually seeing something like this even in a 30-year record. Okay, so that that's that's where where that work uh, up to the 2012 and, and people continue. So so this idea that there is a widening of the tropic and expansion of the Hadley cell is actually a very one a very robust signal in all the climate model projections. Okay, you can see that. All model actually very consistent. We we don't have valid validation for this long term period, but but because we have the we have a convergence of results from the model, it gives us some confidence that maybe the models are converging and telling us something. All right. So, uh, I started doing this work. So I look at the global precipitation pattern of of the CME five models. Of I look at thirty three of the models and look at all the varying parameter. Basically. Many of you, you people, uh, people probably about knowing that it seems like by looking at the models and looking at observation uh, for uh, either 30, 30, 50 a year or from the model, we look at the since industrial, uh, uh, since the industrial age, we're actually getting this idea that wet getting wetter and dry getting drier. Okay, so so my own research in 2013 when I published my first. Uh, paper which look at the global rainfall characteristic. Here, I'm going to focus because I'm going to talk about wildfire, the, the dry getting drier components of it. So, as you can see, this is the climatological model. This is all model world. Okay. Uh, so, so this is climatology. You can see the dry regions, basically uh, the subtropical dry region adjacent to the subtropical high. And then you have the dry region. This is a desert, right? The Saharan desert. If you look at the, as a result of, of uh, double CO2 or quadruple CO2, and that's what you happen. The dry area, actually, the really uh, what I call a dry month, I'm looking at precipitation characteristic. I define a threshold of something less than 0. 0. 0.1 millimeter per, 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 per month or something like that. Very, very uh, light to uh, no precipitation and, and simply plot those area, the frequency of occurrence. Now you can see that. This all the model, all the models I am going to emphasize are telling us that this region is getting drier, this region is getting drier, this region drier. This is a little bit the signal is not clear, but you get drier, drier, drier region. Okay. And so the question is if I look at this pattern, they say this all, in, in fact, if you look at the precipitation, the, the wet getting wetter part, the IDCC becomes stronger. And uh, and then there are some regions. Of course, the monsoon is complicated. This region is not as clear, but this region is actually the, the precipitation increases in that region. So this almost suggests that. So the question is, how does the northern hemisphere this side know this side? How does it know here and here and here here? Almost suggests that something in between is connecting the two regions, and that's why it led me to think that got to be a change in the circulation. The heavy circulation must change as a result of that. Okay, that's what we what we went on to actually wrote another paper, which is probably uh, published in PNAS in 2015, where I looked at 33 CMIP models under a two times CO2 and four times CO2, and look at the precipitation and the vertical motion change. Okay, so this is a sonally average picture of the entire globe. Okay, 90 south to 90 north. And then I look at the climatological precipitation pattern of this, all these models, 
uh, this would be the uh, 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 double CO2. So this is a precipitation pattern. Um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. This is uh, precipitation. This is a vertical motion. Yeah, uh, uh, pattern. All right. So, so, so if you look at a double CO2 scenario, you can see the precipitation change actually occur right deep in the tropics is increased, but there is reduction on both sides precipitation. Okay, and then. And then if you look at the vertical mode, oh, I'm sorry, I, I think I, I, I changed it. This is precipitation, okay? And this is the vertical motion, okay? So you can see there is an increased precipitation, increased vertical motion, and reduction on both sides, okay? Now, if you look at the vertical structure of the precipitation, here's what, 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 what I see. So this is the mean, 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 mean vertical motion. This is the deep tropics, heavy circulation, rising motion, sinking motion, sinking motion, right? If you look at the edge of the cells, okay, this is the tropic. This is the tropic deep convection area, and this would be the edge of the sinking motion. So this would be the 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 the, the, the sinking motion the strongest here, but this would be the edge of the sinking part of the heavy circulation. Now, of course, you notice that there is a very strong double ITZZ in all this model, and there's still a major model problem in the real world. There's a little bit of an I, of a double ITZZ, but but definitely not as strong as this one. So so this is still a model bias problem. But in, in, in even in spite of this bias, in a in a double CO2 world, what happened is that if you just follow the, the movement of this line, this two band, the tropical band, actually getting closer to the equator, and then this outer band here, actually, if you follow it, it actually expands here. So what we are seeing is basically what I have a term for this, is a deep tropical squeeze. The head lead circulation actually squeeze towards the deep uh, equatorial region. And in fact, if you look at the rising motion here, actually, it, the head circulation goes deeper. Because here, you can see, it's, it weakened here, but there's a strong, stronger rising motion and then it goes down there and there's a widening. Of course, there's a weakening on this side. So a uh, very strong downward motion right at the edge of the IDZZ, uh, the, the, the deep tropic. But then there is an expansion of the sinking motion part. This is the part that is the sinking motion, 30 north, uh, 60 north, and also 30 south, 60 south. So this is a subtropic. The subtropic is strongly dominated by sinking motion of the heavy circulation as a result. This is global warming because by definition, we do a, a double CO2. So, double, so the, the, the double uh, uh, CO2 uh, or quadruple CO2. And in this case, we run, we, we, we want to make sure it's a clean model. We don't even consider aerosol effect here. This is just double CO2. This is all greenhouse effect, okay? Of course, all model agree. This is the way that the system go. So in fact, in that paper, we actually find something really interesting. So, so you're looking at two times, four times, all thermal shows a warmer and a moister uh, uh, world in terms of increased specific humidity. But what we found is something really interesting. I call it the deep tropical squeeze, okay? Narrowing and intensification of the IDZZ convective core. There are more high clouds in the deep tropics, less clouds in the subtropics. There's a deeper heavy circulation couple to a widening subtropic. There's an increased subsidence and low level moisture divergence, which is, uh, in, which is consistent with the widening. And then there is an increased tropospheric and near surface drying in a widening subtropic. That, this is the key picture, all right? So if you look at a global anomaly in relative humidity now, okay? So you can see the IDCC is represented by increased moisture in this increased relative humidity right in the deep tropics okay so this is the this is like the uh, this is like the tropopause here this is the stratosphere so in terms of the uh, of the of the uh, of the uh, troposphere it's actually drying the relative humidity is reduced ev almost everywhere except in the deep tropics okay so the question is actually if you read uh, i can explain this very easily uh, so if you look at the, so this is going to be a characteristic signal. In fact, I'm not the first one to, to show this picture. Art before me uh, already showed this picture, but I just use that. It's a very important uh, uh, figure in terms of the drying of the entire atmosphere. So in a warmer climate, 
we actually get a drier atmosphere, troposphere as a result. Uh, uh, okay, so I lose the arrow. Oh, okay. So, so, so all this negative value means reduction in relative humidity. Where it turns out, except in the region where the convection increases, we're bringing moisture up, then you actually get increase in in the relative humidity. So, if you think of relative humidity, is uh, well, the, the reason why why this one is that warm air rises in the deep tropic, they force they 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 follow the moist adiabatic going up there, and it, and because the upper and they conserving more static energy, and because the upper troposphere is very dry. Okay, as a result, the temperature would increase much faster in the upper troposphere than in the lower in the lower troposphere, and that's why you get the you get most of the warming in the uh, in the uh, in the upper troposphere because of the moist adiabatic lapse rate. I'm losing my arrow. Okay, so where is it now? Oh, okay. Yeah. So now, if you think of the relative humidity change, is is basically the ratio of the of the uh, 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 moisture divided by the saturated moisture, or you can use the vapor pressure, vapor pressure, and the saturated pressure. And if you look at the differential form of the relative humidity change, you actually get this equation by incorporating the perfect gas law, which is this quantity called alpha. Okay. Now you can see that. If you increase the temperature, okay, delta T positive, you actually cause a reduction in relative humidity. Okay, keep that. So I call this the thermodynamic effect. All right. But if you look at the DQ and Q, DQ change, so so DQ change. Now this is ambient uh, moisture. This has to do with moisture transport, the circulation part of it. So so this part. Actually, well, so you have warmer temperature, you actually get by by this definition, you actually get reduction in it get drier. And if you get more moisture, you actually get wetter. So it is competition between these two terms, right? In the deep tropics, okay, this term here dominates in the DQ because of the moisture convergence. So as a result, you get a positive in relative humidity. But elsewhere, everywhere here, everywhere here. This, this this term is warming, but DQ is actually negative, as I will show you, because of the moisture transport, because we have sinking motion in that region. So you can think of the temperature change as to measure the thermodynamic effect, and the moisture transport to DQ is the dynamical effect. If you look at this one, so if you look at the climatological, so this is a dry area. This is a climatological dry zones. You can see that. This this actually caused the dry zone to, because this is reduction in relative humidity, caused the dry zone to expand and shift northward, as similarly to this way. So actually, this explains why a global warming, even in a generally warmer and moister world, you are actually getting the troposphere actually dominated by drying. So that's a very important part. Since we published the paper, there has been more paper talking, trying to actually show that this is indeed the case, all right? So we actually have uh, further, uh, right, right now the work is that we, we believe, so this is the hypothesis now, okay? This deep tropical squeeze is really a test bed for cloud radiation, uh, oh, there's another one here, I, I repeated this, sorry. Cloud radiation convection circulation interaction. I actually call it in, in this latest paper I published, the two paper, 19, 2019, called the RC3, RC3 inter I interaction on multiple time scale. I suggest, we suggested that, that on the seasonal to S2S time scale, on interannual time scale, on interdecadal time scale, and we started with global warming, uh, you actually happen like that. So you have warmer sea surface temperature, you cause the IDCC relative humidity to increase, and then and then this is obviously a cartoon. So so this would be the the climatological normal situation. If you have a warmer SST, you build up the convective uh, instability. You have the you have a sharpening of the IDCC. You produce strong sinking motion on both sides of it, and as a result, you push the 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 region the the less cloud and the dry region northward in both hemisphere in this case just completely symmetric okay in an idealized form and you actually push the extra tropical storm track north further northward expanding this whole area 
And we believe, okay, of course, we still need to work hard to prove that that a warmer sea surface temperature can actually sustain this and produce this kind of uh, uh, what we call the deep tropical squeeze uh, phenomena. And in fact, we, we, we look at this in uh, many cases. I'll just show you one example of one year in which we know that the IDCC is very strong. And then another year in which the IDCC is much weaker. We subtract this two years. That's what we find. Now you can see this deep convection, very strong. Right next to that convection is downward motion. This is negative precipitation. And then you can see this entire region is negative precipitation. That means when this side increases precipitation, this entire subtropical high region it actually pushes the, the, the normal uh, uh, the, 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 the um, precipitation due to the mid-latitude uh, wave, the, 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 the eddies northward, and you can see the western U.S. region is drier. When this is wet, this is drier. Okay, so that's that connection that I'm going to forward. Now, so now I'm, I'm going to go to uh, which is the main part of the talk now. Well, in fact, I could stop. Is there any question up to now? Because now I'm going to move on uh, to the second part of the talk here. Uh, so are there any questions up to now? Yeah, I still haven't talked about the wildfire yet, but I'm going to talk about it. Is there any question uh, up to up to this point? Maybe I should spend, uh... So, Emil is unmuted now? Yes. I, I I could not he, I cannot hear you very clearly. What 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 was the question? What was the question? Hello? Anil, you're unmuted. Something. He also asked a question in the Q and A, which I can I can read if. if yeah, I, I I just cannot get your your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll read what he wrote in the in the what they wrote in the Q and A. Um, they asked, "Did you see precipitation signals in the tropics using TRMM data?" Did we see precipitation increase in the in in the tropics? Yes, that's why, that's why, in this paper. Uh, uh, well, let me make sure. No, no, there was a, another paper, a 2020 paper, in which we actually looked into the last 30 years. And see if we can detect this model predicted uh, DT, uh, deep tropical screen. We actually saw it. Okay, I, I in fact I, I I refer to that to that earlier. Uh, yeah, that's why I I think I listed it. I don't have time to check. We we recently wrote this paper. The idea is that okay, all these are model results. Okay, and there there is some uh, and we actually look into in the in the Lao and Tao 2020. GCL, which is a recent paper, we actually look at 30 years of reanalysis data and 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 GBCP and chain precipitation, and we find consistent result. So so our our result from there is that even with 30 years of good record, we can actually see this phenomenon. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question from Dwee Sustano. Who Dwee, you're unmuted right now. Yes, Bill. Uh, this is Dwee. I wonder in the last graph, what happened if delta Rh is actually less than zero in the equator rather than greater than zero? Is what is the, uh, the diagram look like? Oh, this one? Yes. Oh, okay. I don't know. It probably reverse in some uh, uh, reverse in some way. <laughs> a broadening. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, this is kind of hypothesis. Okay, we're suggesting that this is a very fundamental mechanism of interaction of of, of cloud radiation, convection, circulation interaction. Okay, and we have reason to believe that. So, if you've got a cooler SST, things would would probably reverse, but of course, it's not going to be exactly linear. <laughs> so, so it would be expanding. It would be expanded. So, the warmer it would be, gets get narrower. Okay, so this is a cartoon. This is a test bed. We're still working on this. All right. Yeah, I wonder, suppose, let's say, like, say, in the Indonesian maritime continent, before yes. the ENSO happened, yes. that's already yes. cool SST. So it will be delta Rh is less than zero. So yes. I wonder what's going on. 
yeah, when you go to the maritime quantum, then you need to worry about the the uh, the topography. You need to worry the monsoon. In fact, this picture is not as clean in the monsoon region <laughs> because for obvious reason you have the land, uh, the warming of the land, the land sea contrast, which I study a lot in my past <laughs> in yes. my career. So this region turns out. In a way, the Western U.S. is kind of special that this this particular effect seems to be strongly affected Western U.S. because you you have a you have some monsoon, the North American monsoon, much weaker, and you have a vast stretch of ocean with less influence by the topography. When you move to the American continent, it's going to be more complicated. I can assure you. <laughs> okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I, I'm going to go back to, to the main part of the talk. So, as I said, there's no, there's not going to be a single piece of evidence that I can show you and say, aha, this is, this explains everything. No, there's no way you can do that in, in this kind of complex situation. So, we would approach what I call balance off, oh, it's not off, balance off evidence approach using diverse independent data set. And we only have good records for the, Close to the last 30 years. Okay. So 30 years is not enough to actually pinpoint global warming. We hope that the point is that we can still detect global warming signal in that consistent with model prediction. That's the ultimate gain. And I can tell you, we actually see, uh, see that signal. And, and so we use a whole bunch of data. Now, this is where the wildfire come in. So, because we're starting in the wildfire over the US, we are looking at in the, uh, data set, which everybody uses. Which we just adopt them and 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 grid it in a way to be uh, consistent with the other meteorological field. We look at land surface relative humidity from the different centers. We look at cloud amount for ICCP. We look at surface radiation from the NASA surface radiation budget. We look at the drought index, which everybody uses, uh, and also we look at the meteorology. In fact, we know that each each of the reanalysis might have its own uh, kind of kind of uncertainty. We look at five of them to make sure this is also an ensemble average of reanalysis to make sure you get robust results. So I quickly go through go through this. So one thing is that when we look at the Hadley Center global uh, moisture, this is Q, right? This is specific humidity. And then we look at relative humidity. So you can see, okay? So this is real institute data. Now, Globally, and of course, there's not much data over the ocean. There's some island station as, uh, only. So you can see, if you look at uh, 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 specific humidity, indeed, this world is getting positive. This is positive. Warmer, uh, uh, wetter is getting wetter. And you can see the relative humidity globally, average all this point from 80s to 2015, is increasing. Okay. But if you look at relative humidity, this is the same data, but now look at surface, uh, the same station, surface humidity, this is cooling, I mean, not cooling, this is drying. Relative humidity is drying, drying, drying. Western US drying, uh, uh, Brazil drying, uh, this region, and this goes downwards like this. If you average all those points. So this is what happened. There's a regional difference in terms of, we can, to me, now I have to explain why in a warmer world, and wetter world globally, you actually get all this increased dryness because the redistribution, the redistribution of moisture is going, it is is what costs you. Now, now, so so in, in this paper, we focus now on the back to the North America region, uh, the entire North America. So we basically look at the trend record for those years. This would be the burned area. So the solid line is the combine over the entire North America. The red is the U.S which including Alaska, and then the, the purple is Canada, which is another fire prone area, everybody knows. So you, you look at the North American trend of the burn area, clearly you can see a rising trend, but you can always see that most of the rising trend actually come from the North, uh, the US region, including Alaska, but not so much coming out from the Canada side. In fact, Canada has, uh, had, had, had almost like uh, not, not quite a trend, you cannot see it. So, so it's one thing interesting is that a lot of the North American trend comes from the US, including Alaska. And if you look at the warming of all those uh, uh, big regions, the USA and Canada, you can see the warming is about the same. So this is the total warming over North America. You can see up and down, you can see it's oscillation, you can identify ENSO signal here, but clearly there's a trend there, okay? but if you look at the amount of warming 
the three regions are warming pretty much the same. In fact, the ups and downs are very much coincident. So basically, what we are saying that the, the, the temperature seems to be a necessary but not sufficient condition to explain the burn area, because it looks like Canada does not have this robust trend as the North America. So then the next thing we look at is to actually calculate the, the area where it exhibits a strong positive trend. Well, first, uh, 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 a strong trend during this 30, uh, 30 or so period. Then something we find interesting is that, yes, now we start to, to find, first of all, the entire North America, three regions stands out that actually shows um, a, a, in terms of the statistical significance exceeding 90%, you have Alaska, you have the Western US, and you have the Central Canada, Western Central Canada region. And in fact, you would see it's dominated by increased, the, the, the blue areas are actually showing reduction in, in wildfire uh, burn area, so, but, but they are not significant. So there are three regions stand out from this chart. But if you look at the trend, so now if you look at this trend here, Western US, Alaska, and Western Central Canada, it, in fact, this, this trend you can see, the Western US trend is very robust. You can see it just go up there and then into annual variability up and down, and down, it's going up. Of course, we only have to 2017. In fact, we know that up to 2020 is even higher, up way up here, all right? Even on Alaska, that's interesting. Alaska is a very, actually, you can almost see that Alaska fire can get really big, okay, huge. But the trend is actually much weaker compared to the Western US. It turns out the mechanism that I talk about, the heli circulation affects this region less. It's affected more by other variability, but it does show a trend. West uh, 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 Canada actually shows a similar trend they are very different climatic regime compared to the subtropics. And then you can see there's a very barely trend that is 95% significant. And if you remove the uh, 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 two, like in, in Western Central Canada, you remove two years of big fire, that trend is even less. So this is actually insignificant. Only the trend, robust trend is the Western US. Okay, so now we actually look at all this quantity for that period, the trend signal. We look at relative, uh, uh, reduced uh, relative humidity surface, we look at cloudiness, and we look at the downward short wave radiation, and we look at the reduced precipitation. All these are from independent data sources. So if you look at uh, relative humidity, you can see mostly it's negative, where you see that, so in the southern and the western US. And if you look at the cloudiness, you can see there's a reduction in cloudiness, very strong reduction in cloudiness in the Western US region. So this is, in con this is consistent with reduction in relative humidity. And you can see increased short wave downward solar radiation in this region as well. So, all, and then you can see from the uh, PDSI, the reduced precipitation in the southern, this is not as clear as the other one. You can see there's uh, uh, um, a negative value means uh, uh, reduced precipitation. So basically, what we are seeing is that this 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 increased downward radiation actually warms the land and the penetrating boundary. Air. It increased the VPD by this value because now you actually have warming. You can see the relative humidity is reduced because because of the warming of of, of this effect. And then depending on the moisture transport in, in this region, as I will show, DQ in this region in this region, the Western US is also negative. Now you have the temperature and the this, I call it the dynamic effect, working together to produce a strong reduction in relative humidity. Okay, that is going to be, I will show you next, all right? So here, before that, I'm, I, I'm actually show the linear trend correlate and the correlation, the burned area. So, so you look at the relative humidity uh, with respect to the burn area. So. Uh, so this is relative humidity you can see it's going down yeah cloudiness is going down through this period short down uh, short wave uh downwelling solar radiation actually going up okay actually actually going up and then the pdsi which is going negative meaning it is getting dry okay and if you do the correlation of of this time series with the uh, burn area you can see a 99 percent significant correlation in the relative humidity as expected, 
And you can see a strong correlation with the cloudiness. That means reduction in cloudiness. And you can see a strong correlation, not as strong as the other one. This is exit 99%, this only 95%. So increased solar radiation and then reduction in precipitation. Okay, so 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 that is kind of give us idea that uh, that we are seeing some regional signal that is uh, uh, increased that feedback. Now, going back to the to the to the that first chart, we look at reanalysis data to try to see within this 30 period can we detect this deep tropical squeeze. Okay, so this is the analysis of five reanalysis data and looking at the trend through this 30 year period we looked at. We clearly see this is the warming. This is the temperature. I believe yeah, this chart is temperature. So, so we can see warming of the entire troposphere as expected. This is this is the last 30 period. We, we think this is global warming signal because uh, one of the characteristics of the global warming signal is actually cooling, cooling of the stratosphere. We see that also. This is the key thing. Yeah. We actually see this same same thing we saw in the in the um, in the double CO2 and quad, uh, quadruple CO2 experiment, or for the magnitude much smaller. Okay, you we can see this this drying of the entire troposphere, and also the wetting of the deep tropical region, the deep tropical squeeze. You can see this dry dry arms coming and squeeze into here, and a dry arm coming and squeeze into here. So basically, we think the point is that yeah, I mean we 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 think we can detect this signature, characteristic signature of global warming as a result of the change in relative humidity. And we, and we see this, this is all reanalysis data. Of course, you can question individual reanalysis, but if five reanalysis give you a clear signal, that means there is probably something there. Maybe we are getting a little bit closer to the truth here, all right? So, so now we look at other things too. So we look at basically what happened to the change in the subtropical mid sea level pressure. So, so this is the trend, the trend signal now. Okay, so you can see this is the climatologic uh, climatology. So in this trend signal, we are seeing an increase in this in this subtropical high. Now you can see the subtropical high actually extend into the western U.S. region. You can see offshore flow, increased offshore flow coming out into this region, producing this very dry offshore flow, increased anticyclone into this region, which is kind of the things we thing we see i'll show you in the weather map that actually see it on a daily basis now we are seeing it in the 30-year trend so so and uh and and this we tied it directly to could be tied to the global warming signal so we're detecting global signal if we know where to, where to look for now this is another way so so if it's a deep tropical sweep the precipitation has to be increased in the IDCs region. Now we see a little bit of that, not, not as strong as uh, we see. I mean, this is actually the, the model we saw. But one thing interesting we see is that there is reduced precipitation right at the edge of the, of the increased precipitation. So this kind of suggests there's some increase in the IDCs, but a strong reduction. But the most important signal we look at is that if you look at the anomalous downward motion, which is the dotted part, that means all this area, all this area within within the western U.S. and then the subtropical region are showing downward uh, anomalous motion. That means there's subsidence, there's subsidence going on in this region, widespread subsidence in that region, which is the one uh, uh, actually making the entire troposphere uh, drier, not just the surface relative humidity, as I will show the next one, okay, the next chart. So if we look at the three regions, okay, this is Western U.S., this is the uh, Alaska, and this is the, the, the Central uh, Canada, which are the three regions that shows the the, the uh, a trend trend signal in the in the um, uh, wildfire burn. I look at three quantities. One quantity is relative humidity, as a function of the vertical. Okay, these are the linear trend pattern, and then. I look at the uh, temperature, which is in red, okay? And then I look at omega, okay? This is actually, uh, so the omega positive means sinking motion, okay? So here you can clearly see in Western US, you have the entire troposphere actually dry, not just the surface, entire. And you can see there are actually two, two maximums, maximum drying in, in the upper troposphere and maximum drying in the lower part of the atmosphere. I'll come back to that point. And then this subsidence motion 
is happening at the same time where the omega, this is the omega, so this is positive, means sinking motion. You can see strong sinking motion over this region, and then you can see the warming of the of, uh, of the troposphere, not just the surface, the warming actually extends the entire troposphere all the way up above 200 uh, hectopascal. So this is a positive fixed signal I I indicating subsiding air, warming and drying by a diabetic compression. This part I will later, I'll just talk about it, has to do with downslope wind, okay, which is, of course, not very well represented in the model, but you actually see it. If you look at the other two regions, you don't see the same kind of positive feedback. You do see a warming signal uh, in the in in the uh, in the Alaska region, but you don't see clearly the the uh, positive feedback between the, the 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 drying and also the sinking motion. You don't get that because you can see the this part actually is the is the other way around. In in uh, in, in in fact, it's uh, some rising motion. Uh, in, in incorporated. It turns out this is a completely circu different circulation regime compared to the subtropic. Same with the uh, uh, central Canada region. You don't get that positive signal in the troposphere. There's no no positive feedback. And then, yeah, you get a warming. You get a warming up to about here, but then there's no 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 uh, no strong convergence, a diabetic uh, sinking motion, and warming and drying. So so that explains. Uh, to me, explains clear example why the Western U.S. with its geographic position and other factor which I mentioned, uh, which which the model doesn't resolve too well. So basically, now I come back to the 2020 case. So here, this is a weather map now of the mean sea level pressure of August 28, 2020. Just look at this subtropical high. You got a separate branch of the high right here, almost like the, this trend that I look at right in this Great Basin area. So this, this subtropical high extension into West Africa produce an offshore wind and everything that is going to uh, amplify, exacerbate the wildfire region. So, so I want to point out that it's very complicated weather map. You don't know where to look for unless you have this kind of idea that, hey, I'm looking for something here. And it's indeed there on, on August 28th. And of course, on top of that, everybody knows is this a very, uh, strong heat heat dome. This is at I believe at 500 hectopascal uh, something. Yeah, yeah, 500 hectopascal. This is very strong heat heat dome, which kind of produced the sinking motion that of over the entire troposphere that sustained the 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 Western U.S. fire. Okay. Now here is turns out I didn't produce this chart. This is taken from NOAA, uh, and then these people study this and they know that. I mean this is the particular situation with the Western US, you need to have a subtropical high, you need to have offshore offshore wind, and you happen to have in the Western US, this downslope winds, which additionally could produce the, uh, the adiabatic drying and, and warming. That's why you become so severe in that region. And then the coastal region, you get a second time of, of, of enhancement. Now, the model, I would say, this a cost model probably didn't resolve that well, but as I mentioned, they did show a low level uh, enhancement in the, in drying as a result of that, and I believe the model are catching some of the higher resolution model might be actually catching that. Here, here's the well known uh, signal: the the, the, the diabolo wind, the center inner wind. You need this guy. You need this high pressure to develop of the dome, and we saw that in 30 years of linear trend that is sustaining this one. Okay, so so that is what what uh, what we found. And in fact, this is actually a picture I draw after we published our 19, uh, 2015 paper. And you can see that was before I got interested in wildfire. We're already saying that. We're saying that this deepening the, the DTS, so this in a normal case, the honey circulation looks like that, they are, they are the, the feral cells. But in a warmer climate, you got a deeper rising motion, you got sinking motion, you got sinking motion more, and you're gonna expand of the dry cells. So this kind of, I think, even in 30 years data, we see that and we make the linkage to the, especially in the Western Pacific, uh, uh, Western US region, the direct connection to wildfire. So I'm going to conclude uh, my talk here by basically uh, kind of, which is the kind of thing that I would like to pursue is that now we are talking, I talk about the global, I talk about the regional. I obviously didn't talk about the local feedback, which a lot of the ecosystem type are interested in this box here, okay? 
this is actually the, they, they talk about increased VPD, vapor pressure deficit, low profile, weather interaction, feedback, and uh, because of this and produce strong wind. So this is the part I, nev I did not uh, focus a lot of the work. In fact, if you read all the papers on wildfire, they are focused on this because this is where the extreme weather happened. This is where the, where the damage is done right in this box here. So, but there is feedback in there. I call this the local feedback, which I did not touch. Okay. Now we have this part here, which is in, in 10, 10, 20, 15 years ago, we kind of already know about this increased greenhouse gas emission expense of tropical dry zone under greenhouse warming. This is a very robust result from the model. What I have shown you basically in our world is to say that in order to go from here to here, we actually have to go through this regional climate feedback, which is increased adiabatic warming, drying or subsiding tropospheric air, not just surface air, and stronger offshore low level down wind, low clouds, precipitation, more downward short wave radiation, and warm land boundary layer increased relative humidity, and all can be explained by this very simple formula, which is very fundamental physics. In the Western US, you actually have these guys helping you to actually produce that. In other regions of the world, in the subtropic, you might or might not have that, but this will hold, okay? I can tell you, I, I think, uh, if you look at Brazil region, you look at uh, Africa region, this kind of analysis will hold. You have to worry about not just temperature, or dryness, you have to worry about how the water is being distributed. Okay, if you happen to be in a subsiding dry area, you actually get this negative. So this is warming will give you negative delta RH and 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 negative delta Q. A drying region reduced precipitation will also give you a drying, and that is why we believe this is the feedback loop. And and then of course this is the part people talk about, and nobody actually uh, have done or of evidence of that, if you are uh, uh, thinking is that if you have increased wildfire, you actually increase the source and reduce the sink of the atmosphere CO2 because you increase the source by burning. But if the forest actually get depleted, you if, if you don't have enough forest, you reduce the sink. Okay, if these things are allowed to keep on happening, you actually burn out. If there's a reduction in forest, you actually produce a plastic feedback. You're going to increase more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, then you're going to really get this feedback loop going. And then until, I guess, all the forests get destroyed in, in that region. So this is kind of the kind of things we have in mind. People talk about this, that uh, the, 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 the forest, if it's allowed to burn, uh, that it actually would change the balance of the carbon cycle. And which means that you're going to have different uh, storage of greenhouse gas. So, so I think I'll stop here for questions. So this is kind of the summary of where we are in terms of trying to provide the missing link between a lot of work done here and a lot of work done here. I think there needs to be more, more work in different regions of the world, see how much of this regional feedback can enhance uh, uh, exacerbate the wildfire. So I'll stop here for questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Lau. Um, so I received two text questions while you were talking. And just a reminder to everybody, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you, or you can chat it to me. Um, just chat it to the host and I'll read it out loud. So our first question is from Zi Wu Zan. The burned area trends are interesting. Can you tell can you tell me where the burned area data was from? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That is uh that's something that is used by the ecosystem type, and we I I, I thought I'd really show it. Right here. Monitor trends in burn severity, MTBS, and the Canadian National Fire Database. Those are the, uh, there's probably others, but these are the main database you can, you can get a burn area. And in fact, uh, I, I need to mention, we looked at the burn area, we have many different types. We only look at the large uh, fire. That means we look at fire that are uncontrolled. There's a lot of little burns that actually are under control. So those we don't think are, Affected by climate change because they just got uh, uh, managed away. But uh, but we look at the large fire uh, by some criteria from some threshold. So we look at a subset of the of the fire data that give us the the large burns. Yeah, uh, exceeding certain threshold. Yeah. So we subset the data uh, to see the trend. Yeah. Otherwise, the trend would be much more uh, less robust because there there are a lot of 
uh, little fires or smaller fires or, or uh, purposely agricultural burn fire that are also in this record. Yeah. If you are interested in how agricultural burn fire could affect uh, climate, then, then you, you zero in on, on those, those burns. So we only look at basically large uncontrollable, uncontrollable fires. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Liao. Um, the second text question I have right now is from Zheng Zhen Hu. He says, any trend of surface wind speed in Western United States? Yeah, I mean, that's something we, we, we need to look into uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of the, uh, yeah, we haven't looked into that. Yeah, I mean, in, in that region, we, we know that um, the, the wind speed now, but, uh, oh, okay. In fact, in, in fact, we, 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 we see that. Yeah. Although we don't, we didn't specifically look at here, here, here's this picture. Okay, so we can. This is the wind. This is the increased wind. So, so climatologically, the wind will blow this way, right? Will blow this way. So, so there's certainly increased wind, and and the subtropical high come this way. So there's certainly increased wind. Of course, this is a trend signal. So, so we see increase in wind here, coming, coming, coming down this region. Now, but but you but. But most people, when they talk about increased wind, is how they actually uh, uh, spread the wildfire, and that is actually would be the the rim of my in 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 my last slide, where these are the people who are this one right here. Yeah, this is strong wind would actually spread the fire more. This would be this rim here. More, uh, people have looked into that and knowing that this is a very important um, yeah this part here. So. So I didn't look at that. I don't. I don't know that. But from a from a from a regional uh, uh, climate feedback point of view, we actually see that increase uh, in, in increase in, in in stronger offshore wind, offshore wind, offshore flow. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Lau. Um, so that is all I have for text questions. But we can give a minute or so. Oh wait, I just got another one. <laughs> Um, Jing Wang Yu says, thank you very much, Dr. Lau, for the great talk. We have a very active hurricane season in 2020. Can you mention something for the active hurricane season with regard to DTS? Yes, <laughs> that's something I've been uh, uh, watching. One of the idea of the DTS is that if you have this IDCC convection, you're going to change the mid-latitude mid, mid uh, circulation, okay? So when you have a high develop over the the, the, the Western US, you tend to have low develop over the over the East Coast. Okay, so this is the whole idea of wet getting wetter, dry getting drier. Climatologically, the Western US is a drier region and the Eastern US a wetter region. So if you have this and think of it, what comes up must come down. Okay, the, if, if it is sinking motion, that means it's going down. Somewhere it has to go up and it turns out climatologically, you would favor more or actually more hurricane in the east coast because the wet getting wetter okay so that's kind of the reasoning so it's not unreasonable to me that this year 2020 with so strong drying signal over the western us you would actually get wetter signal over the eastern side because think of this uh, perturbation as a wave what we go up someplace has to go down somewhere else or up and down so this is very consistent and in fact uh, it, uh, those are kind of the people. Uh, actually, you should we should look into that. Yeah, that's a uh, uh, in terms of an increased uh, number of uh, hurricanes on the east coast. Yeah. Thank you. We can give people a few more minutes. Oh, they say thank you as well. Um, we can give people a few more a minute or so um, to raise their hands or chat their questions if they have any. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Vlad, uh, let's jump up here. And thank you, Dr. Now. Okay. Great talk. And I thank everyone for coming. Um, and we will put a video on YouTube channel. And you can find the thread on our seminar Google Sheet. And I look forward to seeing you uh, next Monday for our uh, next seminar. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lau, and everybody for attending. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Lau, did yeah. just ask a question. I can um Okay. Let me, let me try and let me see if they're still here. Okay. Hold on. The WebEx interface is a little bit. Actually, let me see if if they're still here. Then you can answer it verbally. All right. Oh yeah, they're still here. Okay. So Anil Kumar said, did you also see these patterns like deep tropical squeeze signals in Toga? Okay, I'm just going to read it. T O G A C O A R E field experiment in Pacific. Toga Core, yeah. yeah. Toga Core, yeah. And Dynamo field experiment in Southern Indian Ocean. Uh huh. Um, did we also see these patterns? In oh, did we see all these patterns? Uh, if it's there, it's not coming out so obvious because it turns out this DTS region has to do with uh, the region where the eye disease is very well defined uh, without topographic influence, without influence in the monsoon, and things like that. So when we look, in, when we move into the maritime continent, like in Toga Core or the Indian Ocean, the, uh, the, uh, the Indian Dipole Mo and all those things, and you have a strong land to the north, uh, right up to the north, then this, this squeeze signal becomes becomes uh, not as clean. Uh, uh, in fact, it's difficult to see. And in fact, um, some would argue that the, that the IDCC really doesn't exist over the, uh, the Asian side. It's like a patch of increased precipitation relating to the monsoon, and it moved uh, move off and south as a result of that. So that, that particular signal is actually, uh, I, I don't believe it's going to be very prominent in the, in the Asian monsoon region. And that, and, but, but the idea, in fact, in our recent paper, when you look at that, even though the in the Asian monsoon region, the IDCC is not as well defined, it's like a big patch, the sinking motion part is still there. That means the uh, the extratropical land region actually is under a a, a, a very broad band of sinking motion uh, because, because when you actually have the influence of the expansion in the Pacific and the Atlantic region, you tend to translate that information all uh, uh, globally and influencing the Asian monsoon as well. So we actually saw over the land region in the Asian monsoon actually become very dry and hot region, especially the north, uh, the, the western desert region. And that's another area we need to look into. Uh, uh, we argued in our thinking that this the the, the, the land region getting hot is a necessary condition for the atmosphere and the land system to respond because the, the land has to get real hot in order to radiate radiation energy under clear, clear sky condition in order to balance the heating by the uh, deep tropics. This is go back to this furnace and radiation fin kind of argument put forward by, uh, by Pierre Humbert more than 30 years ago. And I think that that's that's valid because yeah we know that the land regions are getting really hot uh, in the Asian monsoon region as well. When we're doing Toga Core, we're more interested in just the interannual variability, uh, the Toga Core, and also the much shorter time scale. At that time, I don't think people look at uh, uh, climate warming signal as much. Yeah. 